Some might say lollygagging through Luke, but uh, it's such a great gospel. There's so much here and uh, it's important for us to take all this in. Um, we're, we're really only scratching the surface though. That's one of the things we always have to remember. When you're going through the Bible, it, it, you could just spend a lifetime in just one of these books of the Bible, but uh, it's good to be able to cover some ground. We're getting some work done here this evening. Um, and um, once again, Jesus is going to be hitting the controversial topics. Um, he's not afraid to say things that are offensive. He's not afraid to make people mad at him, which is shocking. Um, and we've been kind of talking about that. There's an interesting story of an old preacher from a long time ago during uh, the reign of King Henry VIII. His name was Hugh Latimer from 1487 to 1555. Um, you know, 500 years ago almost. Like, uh, what an amazing uh, uh, thing that this preacher, uh, he, he goes down as sort of being uh, purposefully um, almost abrasive, uh, but he was also known to be a truth teller, whether uh, people wanted him to say stuff or not. Um, one time he got into some trouble. King Henry was displeased because King Henry VIII was sitting right there in the service there uh, in um, um, the cathedral there of Wor Worcester. Um, but, um, but King Henry was so displeased by his boldness in a sermon, uh, it was convicting to King Henry. So King Henry ordered, as the King of England, uh, Latimer to preach the same sermon next Sunday, but to tone it down and to apologize for some of his previous statements that he made in his sermon. Uh, so here's how his sermon went the following Sunday. He started with this. Um, and you kind of picture him going up to the pulpit, the grand pulpit there, um, and then he starts talking to himself at first. He's speaking to himself. He says this, Hugh Latimer, dost thou know before whom thou this day art to speak to the most high and mighty monarch, the king's most excellent majesty, who can take away thy life if thou offendest? Therefore take heed if thou speakest not a word that may displease. But then consider well, Hugh, dost thou not know from whence thou comest? upon whose message thou art sent, even by the great and mighty God, who is all present and who beholdeth all thy ways and who is able to cast thy soul into hell. Therefore, take care that thou deliverest thy message faithfully. <laughs> then he continued and preached word for word the exact same sermon <laughs> as he had the previous Sunday, uh, but with considerable more energy, uh, they say. <laughs> That's a guy who's not afraid. Hugh Latimer talking to himself there at the beginning. Um, you know, it's interesting because that is the way Jesus would deal with these guys. They're, they're gonna basically say, you can't say this stuff. You can't get away with that. And Jesus is kind of, uh, you know, just unashamedly going contrary to what they would all think was true and what was right and good, but Jesus was not afraid to offend. I remember... Um, Quite a few years after I graduated from high school, I was asked to come and do um, the, the prayer, uh, the benediction or whatever, the, you know, at the graduation of my former high school, like, like a decade later, you know? And I said, sure, I'll come and do that. So I came to the high school where I graduated 10 years later. And, um, and the, the principal of the school, who was at the time, when I was in high school, she was this, just the dean of students, but now she was the big time principal. And she came up to me and said, oh, Brad, it's great to see you after these long years, you know, like 10 years or whatever. And, I, and she said, now, and she, she kind of more said, times have changed. Uh, don't be so direct in your prayer. Uh, keep, she said, keep it general because there are several different kinds of faith represented here at this graduation. Um, and I said, I only pray to the one true God. I'm sorry, I can't accommodate you. I only pray to God uh, of the Bible, uh, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God Jehovah, uh, and his son is Jesus Christ. I can't pray to anyone else, I'm sorry. And she kind of went, <laughs> and walked off. And I just, I just prayed my prayer like I normally would. But I might have emphasized a little more to Jesus uh, <laughs> that, that particular graduation. Um, uh, it felt a little weird going against my, my dean of students, my former dean of students, but it was, it was what was prescribed by the word of God. And um, I, can I just say, we need to learn and watch Jesus here because I feel that we as Christians have started to cower when it comes to speaking the truth. We've bought the, the, the you know, mantra that, man, just keep it to yourself. Don't, don't ruffle feathers. Don't say things that are controversial. They'll get you into trouble. You know, and, and Christians have really started to become very mousy and we're afraid 
you know, and, and we, we're afraid to speak things that are true. Um, and I, I, I also see this sort of funny shroud around truth, and we, we call it wrongly love. We're only going to speak love, and the Bible does say speak the truth in love. But what we've decided to do is only things that feel lovey-dovey to us, but we won't actually speak the truth. If it doesn't feel loving like the way we define love, being, you know, only, you know, saying things that are fluffy and make people happy and all that, that's not, that's not love. Um, um, by the way, love, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 13, pardon me, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, talks about how um, love uh, will, will speak the truth. Uh, and, and that's just part of what love is, even if it hurts. It's still loving. So Jesus is the model for us. And, and he gets invited uh, once again at a dinner, uh, again, at a Pharisee's house. This is a common theme that we've been seeing lately here in Luke. So we have a whole nother dinner here in Luke chapter 14. Let's take a look in verse one. It says, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. Now, by this time, we're all aware, if you've been traveling through this study with us, we, they're, they're keeping an eye on him to make sure they can find something to you know, hold against him. This is amazing that they're sitting there watching him, trying to catch him in something, trying to find something that's incriminating that would help their case against him. Uh, do you think Jesus knew he was going into the lion's den here with these Pharisees? I'm pretty sure he knew what he was getting into. Uh, we'll see that in a second. But it is always interesting how pharisaical it is to watch something with, a, with the purpose of being critical. I hope that none of you are doing that. Uh, what is the attitude that you carry you know, when you come to church uh, to, to receive the word of God? And I'm probably talking to the wrong group here on a Wednesday night, but on, uh, I, you do feel it. Uh, you do feel it sometimes uh, when you're at Sunday morning, one of our five services in the weekend, you feel it like some services particularly, you get people that are just kind of almost listening to, to find fault. And, and it's so uh, sad because they're gonna miss the truth of the word of God. Um, but the attitude is so wrong. These guys, they've got Jesus, the son of the living God in their house and they can hear the mysteries of the cosmos if they want to, but what are they sitting around doing? Watching him to catch him, to say something's wrong. What a missed opportunity these guys have. You can talk to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who created the cosmos, and yet they're just sitting around going, let's see if we can find him in, in something that he says that's wrong. Um, I liken it to going to the hospital saying, let's see if there are sick people around here. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to you know, find sick people in the hospital. Just like you don't have to be very smart to go to church and find people that are sinful and wrong and say stupid stuff, even pastors. Um, if you're there to find fault, it's not very hard. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to do so. But uh, seeking Jesus, that's what it's all about. Seeking Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, that's what we're here to do, and that's what hopefully we always have the attitude. So, um, you know, Jesus is, is uh, always seen... Uh, you know, uh, being invited, uh, eating with others here on the Sabbath day, probably after the synagogue meeting. That was sort of the way they do it. They do the synagogue meeting there locally. Then everybody would go over to somebody's house um, for dinner. Um, that was kind of the first century custom. Uh, older custom was to have a meal together with others, um, you know, uh, there. And, and that's kind of the way this, this probably worked out, after the synagogue. Um, by the way, I think we should get back to that, having meals together. You know, one of the things we read about in Acts 2.42 is that, you know, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. And I think the breaking of bread is communion, but I think it also perhaps is more, um, you know, uh, the idea of that they went and had meals together and enjoyed time with other church people, if you would, Christians. Um, and they did that. Uh, I, I, I wish we could get back to that. Some of the greatest fruit I've seen in ministry here at Athey is when um, some of you guys look for people that need care and love and affection and attention and just invite them out to a meal. Uh, go buy them lunch, an uh, exquisite meal at, you know, Taco Bell or something, uh, you know, or wherever you go. Uh, you know, go and, go and get a meal with people. Uh, go grab some coffee after a service uh, with some folks and, you know, get a, get a group of people together. Um, and by the way, you Wednesday nighters, I, I want to tell you, you guys are our covert operatives. Wednesday nighters, I kind of I think of you as next level, next level Athey Creekers. I'll tell you why. 
because you're willing to be here on a Wednesday night. That tells me a lot. A midweek study, a lot of churches have forsaken their midweek studies, which is because um, nobody showed up. That was the problem. Um, so you guys must, there's something that must be weird about you guys that you're willing to go and do a Wednesday night Bible study. But I like that kind of weird. It's my kind of weird. And I'll tell you, it also tells me that there's a group of people that do want to go deeper in the things of the Lord. And, and I almost look at you Wednesday nighters as covert operatives on weekend services. You know, I can pretty much count on a Wednesday nighter being someone who's probably a believer, uh, somebody who believes in the Bible and believes in Jesus as their savior. Uh, you know, midweek study, that's kind of next level, you know, uh, you know following Jesus, I think. Um, but Sunday morning, man, we have a lot of different people that show up to this building. Um, and uh, they may or may not be saved. By the way, uh, the last few weeks, I don't know if you guys noticed, like the 12 o'clock service, was it two weeks ago, there was probably 60 people in one service that accepted the Lord. Um, it was like the biggest group I've seen in a long time. But that whole weekend, the whole weekend was tons of people accepting Christ. And, and then last week was, was similar. There was just tons of people accepting Jesus, which I just love that people get saved and are giving their hearts to Christ. But I also see you as covert operatives to go in there and how can we care for and personally love on people? Especially the bigger AC Creek gets, the harder that becomes. But we have to sort of lean on some of you guys uh, that are maybe a little more mature in faith to say, man, we're gonna reach out and find people that just need to be discipled, loved on, cared for. Where's your discipleship program, Pastor Brett? Well, I've been a part of a lot of discipleship programs in the past 40 years of ministry, I gotta tell you. Uh, I'll tell you what my favorite version is those thus far, and it's what AC Creek's doing right now. Wednesday night is our discipleship program. Uh, if you're going through the Bible with us, that's a great program, just to go verse by verse through the whole Bible. That's some serious discipleship. Yeah, but what about the one-on-one -on -one stuff? Well, that's where, that's where that, that thing that I'm talking about, where some of you guys look for people to just encourage, to build up in faith, to love on and care for. We need to do that with each other. Our pastoral staff, our, our volunteers, um, our ministry, our elders and deacons. We have a lot of people engaging in, in helping people, but we need at least every one of our, you know, Wednesday nighters as well to jump into that and, and help out. Uh, operatives during the weekend services, looking for those you could maybe minister to, take out to lunch after service or grab coffee. Um, you know, there's, there's so many uh, things about, you know, people coming to church and they go for different reasons. The businessmen that wanna network and try to figure out how to, you know, get to know the cool people at Athey Creek so they can be in the in crowd. Uh, we're gonna see tonight, that's the ugliest thing. We don't want that at all. We want you guys, uh, whatever level of socioeconomic status you stand, uh, to reach out to others, good, bad, or ugly, um, just to love on people. That's what we should do. And Jesus, uh, Jesus is gonna shake this whole thing up, especially about that. Uh, Jesus is out to a meal with this group. And now Jesus is gonna do something here in this chapter that's kind of funny. He's gonna identify five different groups um, that are in some way, shape, or fo form phony, fake, posers, uh, false. Uh, and, and the falsity is, is astounding. Do we live in a culture that's fake, phony, false? Man, I think this kind of fakeness is so rampant today. And I think Jesus would have called out a lot of us. And, and even as he's going to do in this one, Jesus is going to uh, call them all out. He's not pulling his punches. Remember, he's making his way to Jerusalem and is going to ultimately go to the cross. But some of the things he's going to say here in chapter 14 are the things that they're going to hold against him uh, because he's going to tell it like it is here in Luke 14. The first group that he's going to call out, of course, um, not a shocker here, is the Pharisees for their false piety. The Pharisees for their false piety. Uh, let's take a look, verse two. It's really verses two through six. It says, and behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Pause there, what's the dropsy? Um, well, it's, it's the word that comes from hydropikos in the Greek. Um, and the word hydro or hydro, hydropikos, uh, it means uh, water. Um, so it's really known, uh, we might more modern day call this edema. Um, you know, uh, the Greek word dropsy, hydro means water. It means that the afflicted person with the dropsy um, was swollen because of uh, excess in water in the body. Um, but at the same time, thirsty. Uh, and in Bible times, they didn't really know what to do about this. Um, today, we have other solutions to help with, um, you know, swelling. And, and, but it can be very dangerous if you don't treat it. 
Um, but that's the deal here. And so these, these, this guy um, with the dropsies are now, I am of the opinion, you tell me what you think. Do you think maybe the Pharisees planted this guy? Remember, it's the Sabbath day and you've got this guy with the dropsy suddenly showing up to dinner. And what are they doing? They're watching him to see what he's going to do. Well, Jesus, knowing their minds and knowing what, he, what they were all thinking, it says in verse three, it says, and Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now this is great. If you've been with us thus far, we've seen Jesus healing on the Sabbath day a ton already. Um, this is just what they're hoping he'll do. Oh man, I hope he heals the guy with the drops. He will have more evidence against him that he did some work healing on the Sabbath day. That was, that was their dumb uh, you know, write-up that you, got, you can't do a healing thing on a, on a Sabbath day. You'd be breaking the Sabbath. Now, before we get into that topic, um, I love how Jesus approaches this. We can learn from Jesus how to approach these kinds of things. Notice it says, and Jesus answering them, who asked the question? No one, no one asked the, asked the question. Jesus just answered them uh, with a question. Hey, you all, you know, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, by doing this, Jesus does something that's really kind of interesting. First of all, this is a great technique that you and I should use. It's very much like Jesus to start good conversation. Just ask a question, ask a nice loaded question. It's, it's something you see all throughout the Bible. For example, Revelation chapter seven, verse 13 and 14. Do you remember one of the elders? It says one of the 420 elders there in the heavenly scene answered saying to John, um, what are these arrayed in fine white robes and where did they come from? And do you remember what John said? Thou knowest, like, you know, you know, um, you know. And, and, and then he said, well, these are they, which, you know, came out of, out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and the Lord has made them white by the blood of the lamb. Like the guy, the elder goes off on this kind of thing. These are, this is what these people are. But they wouldn't have talked about it had the elder not answered saying, who are these arrayed in fine And John's like, I don't have the foggiest idea. Well, let me tell you, since you asked. Um, that's, that's the technique of Jesus. You might be standing around the water cooler at work and, hey, what do you think of what's going on there in the, in the, the Middle East with Israel and Hamas? Well, breath, that's a charged topic. Uh, but then you can answer, say, well, let me tell you, you know, the Bible says that's gonna happen in the last days. The Bible talks about the nation Israel and how the, 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 the nations will come and, and anti-Semitism will be on the rise. Like that's, that's something the Bible predicted about the last day. Like you, you can use what's going on around you to just answer questions before they're even asked. What I've found is people are really hungry for answers and nobody's got answers like the Bible. The Bible brings legitimate, solid answers to what's going on in the world today. I, I find it hard to hear any legitimate answers from any other source, frankly. And you and I have access to the, the total answer, the, the book, the Bible. It's, it's, where it's, it's where it's at. So maybe you could use Jesus's technique here and ask the question that nobody's asking, but make sure it's a question that's pertinent. See, Jesus asks the question and we see its pertinence because um, he's speaking the truth. Um, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's answering questions that people are asking in their hearts. The Pharisees are saying, let's see if Jesus heals the guy. The people, the multitudes are looking in the windows going, uh, is he gonna heal the guy? Does Jesus have the power to heal? By Jesus asking this question, you almost wonder if, if the people are like, wow, what are the Pharisees gonna say to that? Because they don't even have the power to heal. They've proven that they've never really healed anybody. But meanwhile, they're looking down their pious nose, the false piety that I'm talking about here, saying, you know, you shouldn't heal people on the Sabbath day, but they can't heal. So Jesus has got them kind of in a pickle because if they say, well, you can't heal on the Sabbath, then the idea is if they could, that's very uncaring for them not to heal the poor guy that's sick. Uh, if they could, but if they're, if they're saying it's against the law, then they, it shows they also don't care about the guy. By the way, Jesus had already broken their customs. I'm, I'm not gonna call them laws. They called them laws. But remember, they were just customs. It wasn't the law of Moses that said you couldn't heal on the Sabbath day. It was their dumb rules they added later that said you can't do any work of healing on the Sabbath day. Totally missing the point. 
That's why Jesus is making a point. By the way, we've seen this in Luke chapter four, verse 31 through 37. Um, Jesus cast out the demon on the Sabbath day. Luke chapter four, verse 38 and 39. We saw him heal the man of, of a fever. Uh, in Luke chapter six, verses one through five, we uh, saw him plucking corn on the Sabbath with his disciples. In Luke chapter six, verses six through 10, we saw Jesus um, heal the man with the withered hand. And in Luke chapter 13, we saw Jesus, remember the hunchback crippled woman that we met last week? Uh, we, he, he healed her on the Sabbath day as well. So they've got plenty of ammo if they're trying to use this against them. Why are they still sitting around wondering what he's gonna do about the Sabbath day? But Jesus now kind of turns it back on them and the multitudes are like, yeah, what are the Pharisees, what are you Pharisees gonna say? So Jesus sort of calls them out, puts them on, a, in the, on the spot. Um, so listen to what they do. Their, their response is interesting. Verse 14, and they held their peace and he took, he took him, the, the poor guy with the dropsy, and he healed him and let him go. The, the Pharisees had nothing to say because they knew that if they said, you can't do it, then the people would say, well, you guys um, don't care or love people. Um, if they said, you, we, we could heal on the Sabbath, then, then why don't you? But they couldn't. So they really knew that if they opened their mouths, they'd be in big trouble. So I love how Jesus, you know, the, the fear of the crowd was, was why these guys kept their silence. That's always a, a, scare, uh, a scary point. If you're in a place of keeping your silence because of fear of the crowd, that's also what these Pharisees did. So basically Jesus is using their own tactic against them, forcing them to make a choice to answer. Um, if they could heal, they would have been seen as mean for not doing it on the Sabbath. Uh, if they gave Jesus clearance to heal on the Sabbath, it'd be sort of in their little dumb rules, him, them clearing him to break the law. So Jesus just turns and heals the guy. And then verse five, and Jesus answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out of, on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Now you say, why is this such a big deal? Of course they'd, you know, if they had a donkey or an, uh, an ox fall into a ditch, of course they'd pull them out, unless they're very wealthy. You know, that's a, a costly thing to have a donkey or a, a, an ox that's fallen in. You don't let them die. Um, by the way, when the Mishnah was written, which is sort of the interpretation of the laws of the Old Testament, um, that was one of the uh, reasons you could do something on the Sabbath day. If you're ox, to save the life of an animal, you could do that. So even by this first century, that was their rule. The, the, the rhetorical question, which one of you guys would let your ox die or your donkey die? And the answer is none of them. They would go and pull it out. The point is Jesus is saying, um, then why wouldn't you care about a person? You know, you got a person here who's dying of dropsy and you're saying you can't heal him, but you can go get your ox out of a ditch, which is a lot more work than saying be healed. Um, what a dumb double standard. And Jesus is calling him out for that. By the way, we have dumb double standards like that too in our culture. We care more about animals in a lot of our culture in America than we do about people. It's kind of shocking and really dumb. Uh, I care about animals. I, I love animals. I think we should treat animals with kindness. Unless we're ready to eat them, then we shoot them and eat them. Um, but you do it You do it humanely, of course. Uh, like that's that's obvious. But um, that's what the Bible says. We, you know, the Lord gives us meat to eat. The Bible's clear on that one. You may not know this. Some of you guys can go to jail. If you, if you find an eagle feather in the woods, if you keep it and you take it as your own, guess what? You could be fined $100,000. Um, uh, you can look it up. It's the eagle feather law. Individuals of uh, certifiable Native American ancestry enrolled in a federally recognized tribe are legally authorized to obtain fecal, uh, eagle feathers. Um, but if you're an individual, $100,000 fine, up to one year in prison. If you're an organization and you've kept it, it's $200,000 fine. So if Athey Creek found an eagle and we feather and we took the feather and stuck it in our cap, um, <laughs> 200,000. Um, and it gets way bigger if you, you, after the second offense. Um, you know, I remember, remember when the spotted owl was a thing? Um, you know, the, it's an older law, but if you found an, a spotted owl neck, nest back in the 80s and early 90s, um, and you removed an egg, you, you would be put in prison for five years. Five years for removing an egg from a spotted owl nest, um, which they said was 
I, I remember um, there was kind of a funny news thing back when they were saying that the spotted owl can only be an old growth timber and only there. Meanwhile, there was, because that was their claim, they were, there was all these people showing spotted owl nests everywhere and new forests. And, um, but in Medford, there was a funny thing. Guess where we found a spotted owl nest in Medford when I was living down there in the 80s? In the K of the Kmart. <laughs> there was a Kmart K and inside the K, the spotted owl made this big old nest and uh, had its eggs and stuff. But if you grabbed one of those eggs of that endangered bird, um, you could spend five years in prison. Meanwhile, kill a baby in the womb and you get off totally fine, like it's no big deal. What a weird double standard our culture have. And even the whole abortion of a child is, is not only allowed, but it's almost weirdly celebrated. Have you noticed how the attitude has changed from, you know, abortion is necessary, which it's not, um, but that, that's what the mantra was, you know, 10 years ago, but now it's celebrated. Like, how are we doing that? Um, I don't know if you're proud to be an American, but uh, did you see this CNN article, Vice President Harris to kick off 2024 election year with Reproductive Freedoms Tour. What's, what's Reproductive Freedoms Tour? Well, um, across the country uh, in Battleground, Wisconsin, next month, she's kicking off her 24 election year with a focus on abortion. An issue uh, the Biden campaign pain believes will be critical to mobilizing voters in November. Um, some people believe that the issue of abortion is gonna be the whole deciding factor of 2024. I don't know what's gonna happen in 2024. I, I, I predict chaos, uh, that's, that's what I predict. It's already happening if you haven't been watching the news. It's already starting, hang on to your hat. Um, but, um, but what a strange thing to celebrate. And you know, some people are calling her abortion celebration tour. Um, other news agencies, I chose the CNN one because they, they put their twist on it. Reproductive freedom tour, uh, which I thought was kind of a funny way of saying death to children in the mother's womb. Uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to see what our world has done. Um, Brett, you're being political. No, I'm being biblical. God cares about the unborn child. The Bible tells us that. It's a biblical theme, not a political theme. You can call it political if you want to, but it's not. It's a biblical issue. God cares about the unborn child. Meanwhile, animals get a higher rank than humans. Uh, we have it totally backwards. The Bible puts humans on a higher level than animals and we're to have dominion over the animals uh, and Jesus, he sort of comes against them. You guys care more about your animals, your donkey and your, your, um, your ox than you know about this poor guy that's got this disease. Uh, and, he, and he's really calling out their hypocrisy, false piety. It's funny, it's the same false piety that so many people have in the topic that I was just mentioning of abortion. So group number one here, Jesus calls out these religious leaders, the Pharisees, uh, for their false piety, uh, and he hammers them. They've got nothing to say. They don't even open their mouth because they know if they do, they're gonna look really, really dumb. So they just, they just don't say anything. Group number two is verses seven through 11. It's the guests at the dinner party, and they have sort of this false popularity Contest. Check this out, verse seven. It says, and he put forth a parable to those which were bidden or invited when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, when thou art bidden of any man up to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee or invited thee and him come and say to thee, give up this man's place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room that, that when he that bade thee comes, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted." Apparently in the first century, it really mattered about where you sat when you were invited over to people's house. We still kind of have this a little bit, nothing like in the first century, but you know, the head of the table, for many of your homes, that's still kind of a thing. Whoever sits at the end uh, of your dinner table might be the, the father or the, the person who's in charge or you know, the person who's cooked the meal or you know, like we, we still have a thing about the head of the table. 
Um, but in Bible times, it wasn't just the table. It was the room that you got. You got, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, when you had Thanksgiving, uh, you had a nice table for the adults and then you had the little card table for the kids and put a visqueen down on the floor so that it wouldn't get all messed up. And, you know, you can just hose them off afterward over there, you know, in the, the little kids section. Uh, you know, we all have our layers and levels of where everybody sits. But, um, but as it turns out, in Bible times, it really mattered. When you walked in and, 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 do you get a sense that Jesus walked into this Pharisee house party and he realized, man, these people are so into their position, where they're sitting, uh, who gets the highest seats of the house. Um, and so Jesus turns from the, you know, this, this um, you know, false piety from the Pharisees and now he's turning to the false popularity of the guests of the party. Um, I'm reminded, you know, of, of what the Bible says, you know, there in Proverbs 25, verse six and seven, it says, put forth not thyself in the presence of a king and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is to be said unto thee, come up hither, than thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Um, do you try to seek out the highest seat in the house? Do you wanna be known as the big shot, the, the, the person in charge, the one that should be respected or known? Um, it's such a human nature kind of thing to be respected and to know, be known and appreciated and, and uh, all that and esteemed. But Jesus is saying, don't put yourself uh, falsely in that place. It's better to, to assume you're at the lowest seat of the house and to have them come in and say, uh, man, you shouldn't be sitting here. Um, it's a little bit like what Jesus demonstrated there at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's house, um, you know, um, and also, you know, when he, when he kind of came in, remember when he washed the disciples' feet there? Um, he came in and he girded himself with a towel, stripped himself of his clothes, and he started to wash the disciples' feet. Normally that was a slave's job. You'd give that to a slave. But Jesus goes and, and you know, here's these disciples who are, spend their time talking about which one of them is the greatest. Meanwhile, the greatest is with a towel, washing their stinking feet. Um, Jesus took the lowest place of the room. And, and finally, Peter said, wait a minute, you should not be washing my feet, but I should be washing yours. This is, this is a demonstration really of the servant attitude that Jesus had of really what he's talking about. But these guests at this dinner party, it was all about being the big cheese. Um, you know, um, we have to be careful with that. You know, it's like, uh, even in ministry, you know, pastors and, uh, you know, I'm the pastor and stuff like that. It's like the, the guy drove up in a big old, you know, Cadillac and he pulls up to the church office, not eighth of Greek, but another church. And, um, and the, this guy comes walking in, Hey, I, I'd like to talk to the head hog at the trough. And, and the secretary, church secretary says, well, uh, we don't call him that he's pastor. So-and-so, you know, and, and he said, well, I was just going to donate, you know, a million dollars to the church, but oh, well, if he's not here, I'll go see if the big, the, the, the big pig is in right now. Uh, she said, <laughs> it's like, well, how do we think of people as easy? You know, do we esteem people? We, we really have to be careful about this. That's an imp important. Don't put yourself in a place that makes yourself look like the big shot. Very important. Now, um, what happens is the opposite. You know, Jesus said there in verse 11, whoever exalts himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. The Bible talks about this over and over again. You know, um, Proverbs 15, 33 uh, declares this, the fear of the Lord is, is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. So this idea of being humble is something the Lord has called us to be. Uh, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Don't try to be the big shot. Um, you know, if people uh, are gonna do something, let them do it. Uh, that's kind of what Jesus says. If they're gonna move you to another room, let them do it, but it's, don't do it yourself, that's for sure. Uh, Winston Churchill, my fifth cousin, um, as it turns out, uh, <laughs> he was asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you give a speech, the hall is packed and overflowing? And his response was this, it is quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> you gotta love Churchill and some of his sayings. Um, that's a good, you know, it's funny how you gotta kind of fight to keep perspective when people wanna exalt you. Um, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So, um, you know, this, um, this uh, group number two, false popularity, Jesus warns against it. Group number three in our text here is uh, the host 
uh, the, the host uh, of the group, uh, and, and it speaks of a fake or false hospitality. So we've got number one, Pharisees, false piety. Group number two, the guests with their false popularity being seen in the high seats. But the third group Jesus is gonna call out, he's just kind of going on a rampage here against all the groups. Group number three, the host, false hospitality. How's that work out? Verses 12 through 14, it says this. Then said he also to him that bade him, that means invited him. He says, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Wow, isn't that something? I mean, here's this guy, he's like, oh, great, I invited Jesus over. Now he's telling me I invited the wrong people to my house. He's saying, you, voted, you, you, you got all the wealthy, all the popular, the famous, after he just got over, tell him, stop trying to be cool and a celebrity in this house. Then he turns to the host and says, and look who you invited. Why wouldn't you invite the, the people that don't have meals? You invited all your friends. You know, this is, this is something that I have to admit I've, I've seen and watched in church behavior, and it's not so good. It's not a great look for a church when, when there's sort of um, just people inviting people that can get them somewhere or help contribute to their life or, um, you know, there's something in it for you. Uh, the, the key is to, like Jesus, say, look for the people that can't pay you back. That's who you invite over to dinner. Um, one of the things that happens at church is uh, all the cool kids start hanging out together. Uh, and, and man, we had a group like that a, a few years ago. And I remember um, even talking to a couple of them about it and saying, hey, what if you, instead of inviting all the you know, hipster people, of, uh, you know, the coolest people at Athey Creek, what if you invited some like, people that are totally hurting and needing help and out of luck and down on their luck and needing, you know, and I, I just, what if you put all those resources in that? And, and um, the guy that I was talking to kind of took offense to what I was saying. And then I showed him this scripture and I said, man, you know, this is what Jesus called us to do. And it's just something for you to think about. Well, um, the guy was so offended. He went and told all his hip friends and one by one, they all left Athey Creek. It's kind of a funny thing. They're, they're all gone now. Um, and, uh, and it sort of saddens me a little bit because I liked the group. They were nice people, but they, they were pretty much unwilling to do what I was suggesting, more importantly, what Jesus is suggesting here. Um, and it makes me kind of realize, ooh, that must be a hard one for some of us. Uh, a hard one to remember, man, to, to love the unlovely, the blind, the lame, in fact, that word lame is something that kind of, um, you know, I like it because today in our vernacular, you can say, invite the lame people over to your house. Not the cool kids, the lamos. That, that's who, the losers, that's who we're supposed to invite over. Uh, and that's something that we need to do. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have your close friends over for dinner, but there's an attitude here that I think Jesus is addressing that maybe we all need to check our hearts on. Uh, something to think about. So look for those who are in need, um, uh, you know, and, and also when I mentioned taking people out to lunch after church on Sunday, don't, don't look for the people that, you know, you can be like, oh, these people are really cool. I'm going to connect with them. Um, maybe try to find people that are hurting and in need and looking for ways to reach out and care for them. So the group number three is the host and their false hospitality. Uh, it was only to be repaid back by the wealthy people. That was kind of his idea. And Jesus calls him out on that. Now we come to group number four, verses 15 through 24, the Jews generally, uh, and they have a false security just because they're Jews. Let's take a look. It begins in verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, can I just superimpose my opinion here just for a second? I'm gonna tell you my opinion, but I think this guy, I, I bet the awkwardness in the room is starting to be felt. Wouldn't you think? Jesus just blasted the Pharisees. He just blasted all the guests. And now he blasted the, the host. And he said, you guys are all a bunch of fakes. And this one goes, hey, let's talk about the kingdom. 
Like, let's change the subject here pretty quick. Um, it's like that one guy, you know who it is. They, there's always that person that's always trying to, you know, oh boy, let's change the subject. And you're like, no, we're gonna stay on the subject. Jesus is gonna stay on the subject. Uh, oh, you wanna talk about the kingdom? <laughs> like Jesus, he's not gonna let this guy off. Um, but the, you know, um, the funny thing about the kingdom, um, you know, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom. Why would this guy say this? Um, the answer is, um, he thought, this, the person who was saying this, the Jews, they all thought, they're the ones who are gonna be in the kingdom eating bread together, only the Jews. That, that was their worldview at the time. So they're like, hey, let's get back to something positive that all the Jews are gonna be eating bread together in the kingdom. That's some good, let's talk about things that are what we're for, not what we're against, Jesus. Um, and so what does Jesus do about this? They're assuming something wrong, by the way. The false sense of security the Jews ha had, thinking that they were the ones that were gonna only be eating bread in the kingdom. So verse 16, um, then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. So in Jewish culture, they, one would prepare a feast. No one would know exactly when it would be re ready but they would uh, get an invitation to come and join. And then when the, when the feast was ready, then it was time to come and everybody came to the feast. That was kind of the tradition. So this is something that was very normal to them. Um, it, it's a reminder, by the way, of the marriage feast of the lamb that we're all invited to. Nobody knows the day nor the hour, do we? When is the marriage feast of the lamb gonna happen? Don't have any idea. But it's gonna happen after the rapture of the church when we're taken up to be with the Lord. Th then we'll know. But there's a feast that he's preparing just like in Bible tradition, like the traditions go so perfectly with the eschatological order of events of the end times, including the marriage feast. It's, it's kind of seen here. So Jesus is saying, man, this certain guy made this great supper and he had invited, bade many. Um, but when it came time, uh, come for all things are ready, what happens? A bunch of people give a bunch of dumb excuses of why they're not gonna come. Check it out, verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Who buys a piece of property without seeing it? Don't raise your hand. Um, <laughs> but that's this person. Hey, I bought some property. Uh, uh, I, I think I need to go check out my property. I can't make it to dinner. See ya, that's the first dumb excuse. Um, verse, uh, verse 19, second dumb excuse. Another said, I have bought, bought five yoke of oxen and I need to go prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Uh, again, who buys five yoke of oxen? You know, didn't you kick the tires first before you got the, the, your oxen? You gotta take it for a test drive before you pay? But the point is this, is, this is first century versions of the same thing that we have today. Just dumb excuses. Um, <laughs> You'll love this one, verse 20. Another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. <laughs> and the lady said, dumb excuse. Um, so so um, um, if you just got married, by the way, the best place, place is with Christ uh, to go. But, but isn't it interesting that there's all these excuses. Then in verse 21, so that servant came and it showed his Lord these things, all the excuses, you know. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is still room. So verse 23, the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways, the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall uh, taste of my supper. Okay, so you say, Brett, what's this all about? Well, it, you know, those that were first invited, the, this, this analogy is he's talking about the Jews. Remember, hey, let's talk about the kingdom. Uh, and Jesus said, oh, you wanna talk about that? Well, you guys that think you're all gonna eat at the dinner, because that's what the Jew guy said in verse 15. He said, blessed is he that eat, shall eat bread in the kingdom. And then Jesus said, oh, you wanna know about that? Well, you Jews have been invited to dinner but you're not gonna taste of my dinner. Why not? Well, it's because they all made excuses. Um, you know, the Messiah, uh, Jesus is now on the scene and they're gonna despise him, they're gonna reject him. 
and thus they're not gonna be part of that marriage feast of the lamb. Um, but don't forget, I, I need to make this point, who, who was invited here in this story? Uh, all the crippled, blind, lame, does anybody know who, who would those people be? Us, the Gentile nations would be invited. And, uh, and to the uttermost parts, even to the walls and the edges, you know, this idea here when it says, um, go out into the hedges, uh, in the highways, that means the far lands away. That's us, Portland. We are invited. And when we come to the, to, to the invitation to, to eat and come and dine, like Jesus invites, we get to taste of his dinner. That's a glorious thing. It's not because we're better than the Jews. We just showed up. The Jews didn't show up, that's the problem. So who was invited now? The Gentiles. Now don't forget, the Jews in Israel still wonder why Christians come to Israel and celebrate the Holy Land. Like the Christians uh, are, are sort of head scratchers to my Jewish friends that are in Israel. Like, why do you guys love us so much? They, they don't understand that God still has a plan for them. According to Christianity, true Christianity, there's a lot of those that try to make the argument among so-called Christian circles, that uh, the church has replaced the Jews. The Jews are out of God's plan uh, forevermore. Bad teaching. Um, don't forget Romans 11, 25 and 26. You know, I would not have you ignorant, the Lord says, concerning um, the, 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 the mystery that thus you as Gentiles become wise in your own conceits. He says, but blindness is part has happened to my people, the Jews, Israel, until when? The fullness of the Gentiles become in uh, and then all of Israel shall be saved. So when the rapture of the church happens, the Gentile church, we're gonna be taken away. The tribulation comes. God's gonna wake up the nation of Jews during the seven years of tribulation. And eventually in that tribulation period, they'll see him as he really is, Jesus the Messiah. They'll say, where did you get those wounds? And Jesus say, I received these wounds in the house of my friends. And the Jews will be sobered right up and see that Jesus is the Messiah. But their false sense of security here in the first century during the time of Jesus, hey, we're Jews. We're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of that, we're gonna eat at the dinner table. And Jesus said, pretty much, don't be so sure of that. Uh, you're missing out because you despised the prophets. You rejected my word. And now you're rejecting the Messiah right here, Jesus himself. So you guys are gonna miss the dinner. But the Lord's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call others. So the Jews have a false sense of security in their Jewishness is the problem. And now we see Jesus, uh, you know, continue, we're continuing on in this sort of uh, amazing, just sort of Jesus kind of coming after all these people. You almost wonder, is anybody gonna get away from this dinner unscathed? Um, the answer is no. Uh, Jesus is just going after all these people. It's kind of funny. Uh, you might say, well, come on, Jesus, be positive. The reason I point that out again is just because um, I do believe there's a time to speak truth. I bet you Jesus spoke all these things better than I could as far as, I might be more prickly than I should be. I have a hunch that even when Jesus was talking about all these things, I bet he had a gleam of love in his eye uh, because Jesus is the embodiment of love. Truth and love go hand in hand. And I think, I think Jesus was speaking painful truth and it, and it rubbed them all the wrong way. But I wish that I could have that same notion that Jesus, you know, where he, they marveled at his gracious words. Um, that's something that, that I have to work on, try to, try to fit that in a little bit better. Group number five, verses um, uh, 25 uh, through the end of 35. Um, the, uh, the, the group, the multitude is after dinner. Now, if you could picture, by the way, in your mind's eye, um, these scenes, we see Jesus going into these houses, but it seems like there was always people looking from the outside of these houses. And there was always a buzz now by this time of Jesus. If he was in town, he'd go into somebody's house, but there'd be people looking in the windows from the outside. Um, this is kind of what's happening here, and that's who these people are. Check it out, it's verse, um, verse 25. And there were great multitudes with them. Uh, in other words, all those people couldn't hang out in the house, but they're there with him. And he turned and said unto them. So now he turns to the multitudes that are gathered everywhere else. He says, if any man come, uh, come to me and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters. Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, Brett, this is where the Bible starts really giving me heartburn. Jesus said, unless you hate 
your father, your mother, your children, your brothers, your sister, or even your own life, you cannot be his disciple. Um, uh, what's Jesus saying here? Now, by the way, if you come across the scripture that seems to contradict another scripture, um, and by the way, this is where the secularists, the atheists, they love scriptures like this. What is the Bible? Are you supposed to love your brother or are you supposed to hate your brother? Because the Bible tells you both. And people love to make big deals out of this. Um, what does the Bible say about hatred? Uh, you know, 1 John 3, 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer will have eternal life abiding in him. So the Bible obviously condemns hating your brother. Um, we're, told, we're told over and over, love one another. You'll know my disciples by your love one for another. So what's going on here? This is Jesus using a rhetorical technique um, that's strong comparative, a language that is to say, basically your relationship with God should be so secure um, that in comparison, it's almost as if you hate your family. That's Jesus saying, you can't be my disciple if other affections have priority over your affection for me. Jesus is doing what he's done in previous verses and chapters talking about, you need to count the cost. If you're gonna truly claim to be a disciple of mine, you gotta count the cost. It's the same language we read in previous chapters, verse 27, whosoever doth not bear his cross, remember, take up your cross daily and follow me, um, cannot be my disciple. Now, by the way, this is not talking about salvation. Um, sometimes I think we get confused. What's the difference between a disciple and a person who's saved? Well, uh, a person who's saved is like, would you call the thief on the cross a disciple? No, he really wasn't discipled at all. He didn't follow Jesus. He was nailed to a cross like Jesus, but he was saved. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. There are people I think that are gonna be saved. We'll see them in heaven, but were they really disciples, truly followers of Jesus? The reason I point that out is you have to be careful not to just assume that a, a person who's saved is a disciple. Jesus is saying, if you're gonna be a disciple, you've gotta count the cost uh, and bear the cross. Um, by the way, uh, we did a teaching recently called, what does it mean to bear your cross? We, we, we looked at that a few weeks ago. Misunderstood sometimes. Um, and, and reminder, you're not bearing your cross when you have a rough day at work. That's not you bearing your cross. It's, you know, the, he's telling them to count the costs before following Jesus. Um, and, and then he's gonna give us some interesting sort of examples of that. Verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, you know, enough money, lest um, happily after he hath laid the foundation and it's not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Um, what's Jesus talking about? Uh, I think he's talking about the Washington National Monument. <laughs> uh, you're like, what, is this a cult? Are we in a cult church here? What's, no, no, no. I don't know what Jesus is talking about, but uh, building a tower didn't count the cost. Did you know the Washington Monument, this, this is what happened there. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, as it turns out, the Washington Monument, if you look closely at it, um, you know, you'll notice there's two colors. Um, uh, like one third of the way up, it changes color. Um, you know, th there was a halt in construction uh, when they were building it in 1854, uh, which is quite a construction project for 1854. During cowboy days, um, they were building this thing. Uh, but they only got up like, you know, a hundred and something feet, that first, you know, first one third. Um, uh, but, um, but basically the Washington National Monument Society ran out of money and the project was ground to a halt and it would be sitting there. They built a little wooden roof for the top where you see the color change. If you look closely, there's a kind of a color change there, right in that section there. So they built a little wooden roof there and it sat like that for 25 years, just unfinished. They just didn't have any more money. Um, finally, the US government took over because they were so embarrassed in their capital uh, having this half built monument with a wooden little roof. And it was kind of an embarrassment. 25 years later, the government took over and completed the upper two thirds of the structure. But what they did in 1884, um, they finished it, but they went and got marble from a different quarry. Um, and that's why there's different colors. So the Washington National Monument is actually a monument to our own stupidity. Uh, that, that line there just reminds us, don't, don't uh, you gotta count the cost. Like it's exactly what Jesus said, build a tower 
and you didn't do the math to figure out how much it's gonna cost, uh, and then people start mocking. And that's exactly what happened. People were making fun of the Washington Monument. Um, I, I wonder if, if, uh, if some of us have monuments in our lives where we didn't really count the cost. Things that we started, but they didn't finish. Things that we had great hopes for, but we kind of you know, didn't follow through. Um, Jesus is saying, when it comes to discipleship, you need to make sure and, um, and, uh, and be careful. And, and, you know. So back to group number five on our list, the multitude, false expectancy. They were expecting different things um, when, it, when it meant to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus. They're all kind of thinking, hey, let's follow Jesus. Let's be the multitude that's following Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey, you guys, just like all those other guys, I got a word that's hard for you. If you're gonna follow me, you gotta be willing to count the cost. That's why the strong language, not that he literally wants you to go out and hate your mother, father, sister, brother. He's saying, in comparison, your love for me and following me needs to be so radical that it almost makes it look like hatred. That's the idea um, of what he's saying here. So, um, uh, verse 31, um, he says, or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, um, verse 32, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth, sendeth an, an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Again, Jesus is using strong words saying, if you're gonna follow me, you gotta completely follow me. Don't do this half-hearted discipleship. I wonder if, if we've not given enough consideration to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. People are always saying, we need more discipleship. Well, Jesus has given us discipleship 101 right here. And it's pretty heavy. You gotta be willing to forsake everything, put everything at risk, lay your life down. Um, this is the idea. Um, and boy, how we need pe people that are willing to lay their lives down and not be afraid of, of death or afraid of being thought of as weird. Um, Jesus says, if you're gonna follow me and be a disciple, you better count that cost. And he gets pretty radical on that. Well, verse 34, Jesus then says something we might be familiar from our study in Matthew. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So here, Jesus, remember we talked about this in, in Matthew, be salt and light in this world. And if you want to be effective, you have to have enough saltiness. If your saltiness has been lost, um, you're of no effect. It's like going to Mexico or going to England. Have you ever noticed English food is very bland? I'm sorry, all the British. We have some watch parties over there in England, so we love you guys. But man, I, next time I go to England, I'm bringing my Tabasco sauce. Uh, need a little saltiness over there. Mexico, ooh, I love Mexican food. Salty, spicy, uh, delicious. Um, but uh, it's kind of like that. You know, the Lord says, I want you to be full of flavor as a church, full of saltiness. Um, we don't want to be bland. We want to be effective. So we've got these, you know, these groups here, uh, five groups, the Pharisees, the guests, the hosts, the Jews, the multitude. Um, you know, think about this. If Jesus was at your house, what would he say to you as the host? What would he say about your guests? Like this is where you have to try to make the relationship with Jesus Christ personal. We don't just read about this party back in the first century where Jesus kind of hammered all these groups. But we have to kind of say, what if Jesus came over to my house? Isn't it interesting? That's what Jesus said there in Revelation 3.20 to the church. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The Lord saying, I want to come and dine. Knock, knock, knock. And if you open the door of your, of your heart and invite Christ in to commune with you, sup with you, what would he say to you about you, your guests? Um, this, this story makes me think, oh Lord, uh, check my heart, my attitude, my action, my motivations, because Jesus sees all these things. If you kind of do a review of what we just went over, um, you know, uh, communing with the Lord. Talk about having dinner with Jesus. You know how we do that today is, is communion, the communion table. Whenever we have communion at Athey Creek, um, maybe you should run through some of this stuff about these guys. It's hard to be pious 
falsely pious when you're communing with Christ. If you really know who Jesus is, um, it, that's why I love, when I take communion, one of the things I like to, even though my knees are getting more crickety, I still like going to my knees because it's hard to be prideful when you're on your knees. Have you ever noticed that? Um, it's a good posture for prayer and especially when you're taking communion. Because when I commune with Christ, I don't wanna have a false sense. I'm very religious, I'm very pious. That's a Pharisee that, that Jesus hammered. Group number two, the false popularity. It's hard to be looking for the seat of honor when you're reminded of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Group number three, the false hospitality. It's hard to not be compassionate for those that are hurting and the poor and the blind and the lame if you recognize what Jesus has given to you, his forgiveness and his grace. Um, you know, the, the Jews and their false sense of security, when it comes to salvation, they were saved by grace through faith. The Jews thought they were saved because they were just Jews. But Jesus had to set them straight and remind them what true salvation looked like. Um, and then group number five, um, the multitude, false expectancy, wondering what it meant to be a disciple, but counting the cost. Um, the challenge, don't be false in any of these five areas, but to be doers of the word, doers of the word. That's the goal. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, as we close this Wednesday night out, we pray that you just help us to um, appropriate these truths uh, in our lives practically. Um, Lord, we see these same tendencies from 2,000 years ago of these people, the Pharisees, the multitude, the host, um, you know, the false sense of, of security and all these things. Lord, we don't want to be presumptuous in our sin, but help us to be humble. Humble ourselves before you, having the right mindset. Lord, even this Christmas season, as we invite people over to our houses, um, I pray that we'd look for people that could be cared for, loved on, tended. Um, help us not just to focus on the people we love to be around, but um, help us to learn what it means to sacrifice and to uh, really put down our own desires uh, for the cause of Jesus. Help us with that, Lord. Um, I pray blessing upon these people who've gone through this section of scripture tonight. As hard as it is what Jesus was saying, Lord, give us ears to hear what you say to your church tonight. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen.